So I've seen many, many comments around here lately, specifically asking for infinite procedural generation of the backrooms. And I have seen some videos where people have made their own procedural generation of the backrooms. So I decided that I'd take on the task of making procedural generation of the backrooms in Unity using C Sharp. And because all of the videos I've seen about people making procedural generation of the backrooms feature the creator having infinite time to polish and debug their game, I decided to give myself a limit, three days. Three days, no slack overflow, no asking people for help. I'm completely on my own. Let's do this. On day one, I started experimenting with making grids. Sadly, the standard 3D grid from Unity did not work at all, so I had to code my own grid using a simple vector 3. This made an effect that looks something like this. And then I cracked the code. What you're seeing now is the backrooms. Well, the backrooms without random generation. To achieve this, I simply substituted the cube prefabs with a basic prefab of a 5x5 room with a wall and a roof. When I was making this project, the most important thing to me was ensuring that this beast would actually run optimally on all computers. This means I had to manually code specific features and overrides to stop the game from freezing when you tried to generate the backrooms. This is why I coded a super complex step generation script to achieve lag-free generation of the backrooms. At the surface, the first step of the step generation grid is spawning in an empty room, labeling those empty rooms, then creating the graphic on the grid that represents the given ID of the empty room. When this first step is completed, it's spawned in a new graphic that is white, meaning it's just an empty room with no lighting or added features. The second step of the step generation script is labeling lighting. Though some people would probably generate the lights in the room prefabs themselves, later on I wanted to give more control over how many lights spawn as well as the lag that could be caused by generating empty room prefabs and their light sources simultaneously. To randomize when a light spawns, I simply used a binary randomizer. Though later I'll technically end up changing how this lighting randomization works, this binary randomizer will work for now. When this step is completed, its corresponding room ID on the preview grid will appear green, meaning that its corresponding light has either been generated or passed over. Note, at this stage of development, it shows the entire grid as green when it's done generating, but later I'll modify it to only show the specific rooms that the lights spawn in as cyan, but that's a topic for later in this video. Soon, I'll add far more complicated steps to the step generation grid, but as of now, there are only these two steps that I've coded in. Despite the fact that I'm able to generate these basic rooms with only one wall and a roof, it's not really too impressive. Even though right about now, I did almost just have a heart attack after realizing that my idea could actually work, because until now, I had no clue about whether or not this thing would actually function. But we can all agree that this just isn't going to cut it. And when it comes to the back rooms, you'd expect to see actual rooms, not just walls. This is why the next thing I did was add a multi-binary randomizer that randomly chooses which room type should spawn in. I could then add more types of wall generations and rooms called room types to the room generation array that the script could choose between when generating the rooms so it's not just that same bland wall pattern. This led to an effect that looks something like this. The only problem with doing this is that it led to the back rooms being super claustrophobic and hard to escape due to how crammed it was in the rooms, and most hallways just led to dead ends. This is why I spent the rest of the day remaking all of the rooms and adding a brand new type of room, the empty room. By adding far more of this room type to the room generations array, I'd therefore be raising the chance of an empty room spawning in. This is a really important concept that I use a lot, so I'll just quickly explain it right now. When my step generation script generates rooms, I've been saying that it randomly generates a room. Though this is technically correct, I was still able to calculate how many of each room would spawn in and then control that number using some basic fraction-based math. If the rooms array has six types of rooms in it, then the chance of, say, type two spawning in is roughly 16% assuming each item in the array is different. However, if each of the elements in the array is type two, there would be a 100% chance of type two spawning in. And if there was none of type two in the array, there'd be a 0% chance of type two spawning in. By using this basic fraction-based math, I decided to add four of the empty rooms to raise the chance of an empty room spawning in from 16% to 50%. Since the size of the array is now eight, 
and half of the items in the array are empty. If these calculations are correct, when I generate this map, about half of it will be empty. I started to build off of the fraction-based math from day one to give me more control over the way that the backroom spawned in while inside of runtime. This is a good alternative to having it as a hard-coded value or something that's only accessible in the editors tab. The first thing I did was added in some simple sliders that would determine two things. The generation brightness controls the chance of the light spawning in, which is the value that I'd hard-coded in at the beginning of day one. And then the emptiness slider changes the chance of an empty room spawning in, which is the value that I'd hard coded in at the end of day one. With these two sliders in place, I now have way more control over how empty or how dense the generation should be. As cool as this is, there's a problem that I briefly mentioned yesterday when I had coded the generation panel and the way that the colors appear. If you look at this panel, can you tell me what's wrong? No, you can't. And there's nothing wrong with this panel. And that's what costed me so much of my time. Throughout this three day saga, I constantly added and improved GUI as if I was some kind of GUI freak. But that's not something that I can or will fix anytime soon. The problem with this panel is that it's not clear which rooms have light generated in them, which rooms have no lights, and which rooms are empty. I want this panel to actually tell you which rooms are empty and which rooms have light in them. So without hesitation, I went back to the back end and started finding a way to change the colors of the room IDs that have specific special features generated within them. This feature took a lot of trial and error and the majority of day two to complete. By the night of day two, I mastered the ability of changing the colors of specific room IDs depending on their status. After generating a map, the panel looks something like this. Cyan represents the fact that a light is spawned in. Brown represents an empty room. Dark gray represents one of the default rooms. And there's four more that I'll code in later, but I don't want to get into detail on those yet. Now you can clearly see the effects of changing these settings around, which is probably one of my most favorite features of this project. Now that the display is more accurate, another big problem with this script arose. You can walk off the edge of the back rooms. To fix this, I would need to add a specific hard-coded feature that ensures that some kind of barrier room are generated all around the back rooms. These special rooms have walls on all four sides, which saves me time so I don't have to go into some crazy script determining if the barrier is on the right, left, or the top versus the bottom of the map. Granted, this barrier creation method was still extremely complicated and very difficult to code. It led to some annoying problems like this, and this, and this, and this, and this, oh my gosh, this script was so complicated to code. After hours of coding and debugging, I finally got the barrier system to work, and I also decided to add a beep sound to each of the rooms, which would play in each of the rooms, and each of the different room type has a different type of pitch on their room creation. Yeah, I'm leaving that in. And each of the different types of the rooms has a different pitch of the beep. I also made a new type of color to the preview map, which is purple. It's harder to explain what this color is, so I'll just slightly explain it. These two rooms are hard-coded to be weird rooms, because they're not really empty, but they're also not completely full. Because they're so odd and different, I specifically labeled them as purple. These special weird rooms are actually byproducts of an error that I had near the end of day one, but I decided to keep them in because it gave the generation a lot more variety. Now, when generating a room with all of the progress made in day two, the generation looks and sounds like this. After this, I was completely exhausted and decided to call it a night. On day three, I suddenly had a lot more motivation than I did while coding that monster of a script in day two, go figure, and I decided to focus on player development. The first thing I did was hopped over to my scene in the Backrooms Game Lab tutorial, then I copied over the character controller, which already had complete character settings that I didn't need to waste my time modifying. 
Then I'd create a button that instantiates the character object at a fixed Y position at the XY positions of the position that the camera is at in the scene. Now that I have a player, I was considering just ending the project here. But the problem is, this game actually has no objective. It's just random generation of the backrooms. I wanted my game to actually be fun, meaning I needed to code in objectives, difficulty, items, and most importantly, actual infinite generation of the backrooms. The first thing I did was begin wiring together an objective. The objective I decided to include was exiting the backrooms as fast as possible. I figured it would be easy to exit the game, but still hard enough for the game to be fun. This means that adding an objective that specifically makes use of this mechanic would make for an intense game. To make the exit, I added a new type of room, an exit room. This room is displayed as red in the preview panel. With this preview grid map, I found out that I could find the exit room by lining up my position in game with where I am in the map. I could simply do this by using the position of the lights on the ceiling and matching them up with the cyan lights in the preview map. The only problem with this is that it rose a new error that had actually been here since the very beginning. When I generate this map, the lights on the preview panel should perfectly line up with the maps in game. There is a clear problem here. The preview map appears to be mirrored. I needed confirmation that this was actually an error, because if it is an error, it could be very deep coded in the code from day one. So I ran a few more generations and got the same outcome every time. The preview map is mirrored. All right, I'll be honest. At first, I thought that the core generation script was horribly messed up and I'd have to go back to the drawing board, but it turns out that the preview panel's grid layout group was simply ticked onto the wrong child alignment for some reason, meaning I didn't have to recode any of the generation script. If I did have to recode the generation script, this would probably be a five day video rather than just a three day saga. After changing the child alignment to lower left, the preview panel was no longer mirrored, and it was finally aligned and accurate to the game map. But I quickly realized that I was celebrating way too soon as the preview map being fixed exposed another error. The generation of the objective room, or the exit to the backrooms, which appears red in the preview grid, isn't accurate to where it spawns in the scene window. In this example, the preview grid says that the exit is somewhere at the top left of the map, but in actuality, it's somewhere at the bottom left. It's not on the exact opposite of the map, so I know it's not mirrored, but it's just in the wrong spot. This is weird. It's time to go back to the drawing board for a while. Finally, after about half an hour of coding and debugging later, I had fixed this annoying bug, finally giving me the green light to work on something else and put the core generation script aside. With the core generation script aside, I'd create two features that would go on to shape the rest of this game, a timer function and a difficulty function. While I was still experimenting with this game, I observed that the difficulty of the game increases and decreases depending on these two variables. For example, if the game is extremely empty and bright, it's very very easy to find the exit, but if it's super dense and dark, it's significantly harder to find the exit. This simple logic allowed me to create a difficulty system that tells you how hard it will be to find the exit of the game in a short amount of time. I also decided to add a special seeker difficulty called Pro Mode, which occurs when the game is on all of the hardest settings, and then I also coded in a new golden square which represents where the character will spawn. Unlike the core generation, the spawn location is not randomized. The pro mode feature of this game is extremely difficult, and it took me over two minutes to complete on my first try. Despite the fact that this game feels complete, there was still one more feature that I've wanted to add in since day one. Breadcrumbs. While running QA on this game, I noticed that it was hard to know whether or not you've explored a specific part of the giant 10 meter by 10 meter map. 
This is why in true Hansel and Gretel form, I decided to code in breadcrumbs. At first, they had no limit, but then I thought it was way too cheap and I decided to make a limit that you can customize. However, any value of breadcrumbs used that's higher than zero disables your ability to enter the pro mode in that generation due to how easy the breadcrumbs made this game. Here's what the game looks like with the breadcrumbs, which I officially named Glow Sticks. And that's it. This is the entire game. A procedural infinite generator of the backrooms created in three days. The, wait, wait. This isn't infinite. It's 10 by 10. We need infinite generation. So I hopped over to a new scene and copied over the core generation script. I wanted to make the infinite generation rooms bigger so that it truly felt infinite. To do this, I created nine extra room types that are 10 by 10, and each were way more complicated versions of the standard rooms used in the standard core generator. All I had to do was make the map size in the infinite generation script way bigger. The only problem is that all of the size values of the map were hard-coded, meaning to change them, I would need to reprogram the entire generation script, hence why I copied over the core generation script into a new script called the infinite generation script. Now all I have to do is reprogram a script that I made two days ago, which is way easier said than done. Here we go. I also encountered this strange bug where all of the room types were the exact same, which led to something that looked familiar to the found footage video from Kane Pixels. Luckily I'd encountered this bug previously in the core generation script, so I was able to quickly fix that. It also reminded me of the Farlands error, which I personally like, so I decided to keep this in the video. After hours of reprogramming and debugging, I finally had an effect that looks like this. The only problem is that all of the clips you see of my virtually infinite generation are generating extremely slow, so I had to speed them up to over five times their original speed to make the clips actually flow smooth. I don't know about you, but I don't want to wait for an extremely long time just for an infinite generation of the backrooms, which I'm probably just going to delete a few seconds later. So the last and final feature I'd ever go on to code into this game is lag balance, meaning the program creates virtually infinite generation of the backrooms within seconds of pressing the generate button. The program also does this without freezing or crashing your game, hence how it gets its name, lag balance. With that, my virtually infinite backroom speedrunner game was complete. This three-day saga of debugging and reprogramming had finally come to an end. I think that if this saga has taught me anything, it shows that anyone, no matter the experience level, can go on to achieve anything as long as you care enough to spend enough time learning how to do it. When I first started game development, I would never have possibly imagined that I'd be able to create something like this in just three days. But with just a few years of experience, this goes on to show that anyone can do anything so long as you put your mind to it and believe in yourself. To show this is true, stay tuned for later when I release an intermediate level tutorial showing you how to code your own procedural generation of the backrooms. Stay tuned for when it releases because it will be up pretty soon. Of course, this will be way less complex than this generation of the backrooms, but it will still be relatively infinite generation of the backrooms. But anyways guys, this has been my three day saga of infinite procedural generation of the backrooms in Unity. I've been developer Jake and we will see you in the next one.